for uh, asset pricing. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm John Cochran. Uh, I'm the guy nominally running the class. Uh, who else do we have here? I'm still here. My name is Adam. I'm one of the TAs. I'm a third year PhD student in financial economics at University of Chicago. My name is Nina. I'm a fourth year a PhD student in finance at the University of St. Gallen, and it's my pleasure to have you here. And let's see, uh, Mario, introduce yourself if you're if you're there. Nope, looks like Mario's not working anymore. Defunchu, introduce yourself. So I'm an undergraduate student at the IIT Kanpur for mathematics. Great, welcome. And uh, so, do we have somebody else on there? No, it looks. Yep, Mario's trying. This is, so this is Mario from Peru who's having internet problems. Okay, that's not going to work. Adam, why don't you uh, start in and let's let's have a question. Yes, definitely. Here, let me find the the first question. Oh, I have internet problems as well. I apologize. It's good. The first question. OK, go ahead. The first question comes from Leonard from the New York City area. He's in life insurance and risk manager with a Bachelor of Science in Math and Physics and a Master's in Computational Finance. He, he has a question for the second hang hangout. How does one factor in the state of the market and the relative position of market makers or dealers in the pricing equation? Nina had some sort of emergency, so let's let's try that one again. <laughs> okay, there's a a question from Leonard from New York City. He's asking, how does one factor in the state of the market or the relative position of market makers or dealers in the pricing formula? For example, if there's a scarcity of, of liquidity, is there a risk of sort of dealer liquidity to keep inventory? Um, if there's a terror event or a catastrophe, um, how 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 do we think about that in in the framework presented in in class? Okay, well that's uh, I know you picked that question because it's especially a good one. And and Mario, we got your note that you could hear, so uh, we'll we'll call on you. If you can't uh, talk to us, maybe you can send us a message later on. Uh, so there there are two questions in there. Uh, one is this whole business of dealer liquidity, market maker, and so forth, and um, that's an especially deep one because that's at the heart of what's going on in a lot of really interesting research right now. Um, and uh, so the theory we've talked about so far is the really simple one where every single person in the whole country, in the whole world, is thinking about whether they want to buy a stock or not. Um, and so my the margin utility of my consumption, the margin utility of your consumption, everybody's consumption is, is integrated to stock prices. Of course, in the financial crisis, um, we seem to see things like like uh, dealers running out of money and they dump stocks and, and stock prices go down. Ooh, where's that come from? Well, to make sense of that, you need to have a model where you and me are just not there, uh, where only dealers are buying things. And that, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Um, my joke version of this is if, if you show up at 2 o'clock in the morning in front of the University of Chicago with a truckload of tomatoes and you say, I'm selling tomatoes, that you're not going to get a good price for them. The question is really how long, so this is the big argument going on in academic finance right now, <coughs> is dealer leverage, dealer, is the discount factor in our model that by the, the dealer's margin utility consumption and the rest of us are kind of sitting there, or is it integrated and, and all of us are there? I think we'd all agree pretty much in the very short run, the dealers are in charge, uh, but if the prices get very dislocated, more people come in. And, and in the long run, asset prices are more integrated, and, and the question is how long is the long run? Uh, and I've, I'm kind of been a skeptic on, on how powerful, I mean, outside of a crisis, how powerful the whole liquidity thing is, because I observe there's lots of deep pockets out there. There's sovereign wealth funds and endowments and, and Warren Buffetts and so forth who are not leveraged and whose job it is to go around and, and buy up bargains. Uh, so that's a... Uh, that's a, a super a quick version of that. Adam, Nina, you got any more comments on that question? It's a great question. I mean, kind of like all of what's going on in the finance workshops these days. Well, there's, a, there's one comment. There's a, f a follow-up question from 
Leonard is whether we, we tweak utilities of the buyers and the sellers um, to get market clearing and, and sort of maybe match the price dynamics that, that we see when there are liquidity crises. I think one of the, the takeaways is that as financial economists, we often don't think that we want to, to model particular utilities or particular sort of preferences, unless, of course, we want to be behavioral. We would rather think in terms of technology. Are there constraints in the physical world that sort of can induce the different price dynamics that we see, for example, sort of margin constraints or um, no short selling constraints, rather than we think that, that, that we want to model what's going on inside the heads of, of, of the agents. Yeah, and this is, uh, let, let's not be, so kind of in the long history of economics, there's been an aesthetic preference for under, you see weird stuff. And do you understand that weird stuff is, oh, or people want something weird, it's in their preferences, or do you understand weird stuff as something's wrong in the market structure? And um, certainly this, uh, this, these models of, of li liquidity problems and so forth are in that uh, framework. And when we see weird stuff, it is, I think, more, um, uh, it's more satisfying to find that people are just about the same everywhere and, and kind of reasonable, but stuff goes wrong with their institutions. And that is a challenge to the behavioral. A lot of the behavioral philosophy has been, look, the markets are just fine. It's just the people in them are a little bit crazy. Uh, and that's two of the big, the big tensions going on right now. Uh, maybe we should ask our, is there Mario or, or, or Dipancho, you got something to say on this topic? Actually, I'm not aware of uh, much on the modeling theory. I'm quite new to the topic, so I'm not really happy uh, to be responsible to it. Oh, good. <laughs> you guys can be aware there is this tension in how we model stuff. Again, in this class, we're starting with really simple, and then we add more of the frictions. That doesn't mean the frictions aren't there. It just means you take 2 plus 2 equals 4 before you start doing prime number theorems. Okay, Nina, why don't you take a turn? Um, the next question. Yes, next it's question. It's from uh, Bruno, who is based in London, and he works on asset allocation solutions for private clients. And um, he wants to know how the asset pricing model accommodates time varying utility functions. He argues that utility depends on values of individuals, which changes over time. Utility depends on sorry, what of what for individuals? Of on values of individuals. So he says that, for example, a billionaire in his twenties has a different preference than a billionaire at a different stage of life. Uh, they might both look down on the marginal million, but they are doing it in different ways. And this, I think, should show change to the shape of their utility functions. Does it make sense thinking about utility functions that shift with age as well as wealth? Uh, yes. <laughs> so we, we have a framework here that's enormously flexible. So you can put in a utility functions that are different over age, utility functions that are different over people, Utility, uh, so some of my own uh, most known research has been utility functions where not just today's consumption but yesterday's consumption matters. A uh, utility function where, where consumption is sort of habit forming. Uh, you can put all this stuff. Now, the, the secret of success in economic modeling is putting in as little as possible, not throwing in all the plausible ingredients and seeing what comes out of the scene. So, um, the best way to think about this is so what phenomenon in asset markets you think is really importantly explained by a change in utility function uh, with wealth. Or are people, uh, I mean, young people and old people, uh, in some ways, uh, much more the same. But I mean, for example, we, we often do this in portfolio theory. Um, people who have more time to go have a different portfolio problem than people who have less time to go. So that's an example of heterogeneity and preferences. There's a bunch of great research, um, Stavros Panagias at the University of Chicago. It's the stuff with some people are more risk averse and some people are less risk averse. That one, when the market goes down, more of the stuff ends up in the hands of the risk averse. That, that's, that's a good example because there, this new ingredient helps to explain something that otherwise uh, wouldn't make much sense. So um, on the big philosophical thing, you can put in anything you want. Uh, the question is, what really are you going to get out of it? Um, 
And I want to, I'm going to draw a little drawing here. Uh, I want to remind you of baby micro, how, how it works. Um, there's a, uh, I'm going to draw off my drawing talents are not very good this morning. Uh, so here, here's a picture with an indifference curve, a uh, budget constraint and an indifference curve. And there's two different utility functions. One, one person wants more of that stuff, and the other person wants more of that stuff. Now, both are at their margins. So what's happened is that the person who wants more, I guess you always do this is apples, and, and that's, that's oranges. So this is an indifference curve where one guy wants more apples, and one guy wants more oranges. And what they do is, is they trade, they buy different amounts, but at the margin, marginal utility of apples versus marginal utility of oranges is the same for both of them. So uh, our basic margin utility idea accommodates a lot of heterogeneity. OK, I've said enough. Uh, comments from you guys? Nope, yeah, he, actually, uh, Bruno also asks how to accommodate informational, asymmetri informational asymmetries and liquidity premium. Oh, boy. <laughs> so you guys are learning. I, I can't do more than one question at a time. <laughs> So again, boy, I'm going to be giving the same answer over and over today. It's a simple one. It's fairly straightforward to add all this stuff if you want to. Uh, and what he's named are sort of two of the huge research areas in finance. Informational symmetries. What if I know something, you know something, you don't know it well. Uh, that's what markets are all about. And this is both a big field and I think one that is, is right for you. Because, um, Another way of putting it, the models we're talking about in this class have, have a, a minor way in which they don't meet the real world. There is no trading. Models in our class, the, the investor sits on the market portfolio, prices move, but nobody ever buys or sells anything. Now, you're in the real world, you kind of know that's not true, right? So why do people buy and sell stuff? Well, they have different information. Now, in our model, what happens is if I know something, suppose I'm hanging out here now in the Silicon Valley and I say, oh, I got this great information. Apple's going up tomorrow. What happens is I try to buy Apple, and everybody sees that and they say, "Oh, John's buying Apple today. He must know something that we don't know." So we're not going to we demand an even higher price. Um, and then what happens is I keep getting the price up, and nobody ever buys or sells it. Now that's a terrible model world. Uh, so you need you can see where information asymmetry modeling is. Liquidity premiums. Uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, we might. Yeah, we're not going to get there. Uh, but money is a classic example. It's a security that doesn't pay any interest. It's valuable because of its liquidity. There's a whole. So now we got to write down what is it that's convenient about money, and you can add liquidity premiums. That stuff is all layered on top of what we're doing. So when you do the models, of, let me try to make a little ad for this class. When you do the models of information asymmetry or liquidity premiums, they start with what we're doing, and then that's the cake, and then they put some frosting on top of it. Okay, now let's see. Let's change one assumption here. There's some security more valuable. Have I done a good enough job there? I mean, I, I, that was a long answer, but I did try yeah. to summarize like five I minutes. think it was clear, yeah. That's a good answer. Let, why don't we move on to the next one? I yeah, have. Let's let, uh, let's, see our, let's let our guest ask a question. Um, who's on? Uh, Deepanshu, are you, is, yeah, you seem to be on and your internet's working. No, uh, so what uh, when you told about the news that uh, you have something about Apple and you are going to buy Apple. So when uh, I am pricing something, uh, is there any model which uh, also includes this uh, textual classification, which are qualitative variables rather than quantitative, like the beta or uh, that, like the CAPM model, which includes beta, which is purely quantitative. And uh, if there is a model which includes qualitative variables. Ah. So uh, an answer two ways. One is, in our model, do we think of the people in our model as being quantitative, qualitative valuers? And there I would say absolutely yes. The, the tradition in economics all along is we write, we write equations. But we don't assume that the people in our models uh, understand equations. We're, we're modeling them as if they're rational. And um, that tradition goes back, in, in the behavioral sciences, that goes back a long way. You know, the people who study uh, how, how hard does the cheetah run when he's trying to chase the hyena. Uh, so he solves an optimum problem, and they write down the optimum problem, and that describes very well when the cheetah gives up the hunt. 
but we don't think the cheetah is actually doing a dynamic program inside his head. And, and people are the same way. Uh, people are out there making qualitative judgments. We write down a very simple model where we solve things quantitatively, and, and that model describes a lot of reality, and, and that's, that's economics. Now, that may, that's a sort of larger philosophical answer to your question. The second answer is, is should our models include qualitative information? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have these, we, the model we write down is, is mostly quantitative. And there I'd say uh, increasingly yes, um, but it's hard to do. I mean, how do you take qualitative information and put it in a model? Um, but uh, there, for example, people who are doing um, uh, trading strategies and hedge funds and stuff like that, increasingly, um, well, one, one thing they do now is, is they search the Twitter feed. And so, uh, you know, they watch the, the Twitter feed or, or they're watching Google Analytics. They're, they're watching uh, when, when people search for Apple a lot, they say, oh, there must be information about Apple, and they trade on it. So there are ways uh, in, in models used for trading, there are ways of including um, uh, uh, of including that kind of qualitative information. Does that does this, Nina Adam? Does that spark something useful for you? Yeah, I think that I mean even if you use qualitative information, in the end you somehow have to convert it to quantitative to some numbers so that to use in your model. Uh, right, and that's right. So what we would do is we say number of Apple searches <laughs> then becomes yeah. the quantitative information. Uh, there's a, this deep, deep issue that uh, all of science, including economics, comes down to quantifying something or other. Uh, did, we, did we sort of answer your question? There's a tendency here to take a question, kind of wander off with it. Oops, oops, looks like we <laughs> that in India. Okay. Uh, do we have any of our other guests left? Mario, are you still there? No, Mario is not here, unfortunately. Okay, sorry we missed you, Mario. Okay, it looks like we've got Adam and, and by the way, Adam and Nina, um, are they seeing the right person on the Google Plus? I mean, I see Nina when I'm talking. Uh, Adam, are you seeing, when I'm talking, do you see me or do you see Nina? I see you all the time. Well, that's really sweet, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, somehow we need to figure out whether the Google Plus is showing the right person. Uh, but in the meantime, Adam, why don't you give us a question? Definitely. I have a question from Dimitri. Dimitri has a PhD in computer science and a great interest in finance. He recently started his own company trading bitcoins. And he has a Ooh. question about uh, one material. I'm sorry? He has a question about the, the material in, in the homework in week one. Okay. So the week one, uh, the whole point, he says, was to consider horizon effects in returns. It showed that both the compound lock, long horizon um, returns uh, and variance scale linearly with the number of years. However, annualized returns have a lower per year variance. And then his question, Dimitri's question is, is this distortion simply due to some problem because of the, the what he calls the square squared nature of variance, um, and and is this a problem? Could we potentially do away with this by using absolute deviation as a measure of dispersion instead? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we're and, and we should be talking. We always get off into philosophy and and uh, <laughs> and don't actually talk about the material of this class. Uh, and boy, I, we should have Dimitri on and talk about Bitcoin sometime. That would be fun. Uh, so the point of these uh, the point of these uh, our exercises was really to dispel some common fallacies uh, more than uh, uh, so it is just let's take the statements that we've got and say what they are and, and understand what they're not. It, the actual returns, so the ratio of mean return to variance of return, is the same at all horizons if returns are IID. So that's a fact. And that fact is behind the classic theorem. Under some circumstances, uh, the alloc optimal allocation to stocks and bonds is independent of the investor's horizon. We'll, we'll study that theorem later on, but underlying it with this fact about means and variances. There's a common fallacy. So it is also true that the variance of annualized returns, which has that 1 over n in there, gets smaller and smaller as the horizon gets bigger and bigger. So a lot of people have taken that fact and they say, oh, look, 
the variance of annualized returns is smaller for longer horizons, stocks must be safer at longer horizons. The forgetting is that the actual amount of money you have, the, the money you get at the end of the horizon, it is the variance, is the annual return compounded back up again, so that the 1 over n uh, and the times n offset each other, so that it, even though the annualized return gets better, uh, the actual volatility of the return, the money you get, uh, it, it's, it gets gets worse with Horizon. Uh, and it was just a, uh, it's, it's a classic fallacy to, to pay attention to the wrong number. And really, that was all, the, all, the only point. Uh, it, j it just means that understand the number you're looking at. And the number of variance of annualized returns, uh, well, in, the, in 10 years from now, you don't get to eat annualized returns. You eat the actual return. So don't make that mistake. I think that that was the only, it was a smaller point than it may have seemed. Nina, how are you? We had a brief visit. Sure. Let's see, he seems to be gone again. Shall we move to the next question? Sure. Next question is from Marco Corrales. He is financial analyst mainly for great risk issues for a consulting firm in Germany. So he said there are three forms of the efficient market hypothesis weak, semi strong, and strong. The semi strong form implies that fundamental analysis will not reliably produce excess returns. All public information will be processed and will be reflected in prices rapidly. He has read um, Mal Kiel's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, uh, that Professor Cochrane also recommends in his book about asset pricing. Mal Kiel states that most analysts on the Wall Street do fundamental analysis and that they are not very useful in reliably determining over, under or correctly valued asset prices. So his question is, what does semi-strong form of the efficient market hypothesis imply for fundamental analysis? Aren't they useful at all or are they needed in the first place to incorporate the new information? And how is fundamental analysis different from incorporating the new information? Yeah. Um so he's got the basic picture. These various forms of the efficient markets hypothesis, for the rest of you who aren't watching, who are watching, efficient market says that information is incorporated into prices. And the reason is competition. Um, uh, if people know about the information, they bid the prices up, and then the prices reveal the information. And these various forms are, are basically, basically uh, listing information by how much it costs. So the weak form is very cheap information, the information in past prices. The semi-strong form is information that's a little more expensive to get, like annual reports, other publicly available information. And the strong form includes information that's very, very hard to get, which is private information. Uh, and, and so what the really, this theory just says, competition means information should get reflected in prices. But of course, how expensive that information is to get, how strong the competition is, is going to determine the extent to which uh, that works. And it's not a religion. Even Fama says, look, markets are not efficient. They're just, they're pretty, they're a lot closer to it than you might have thought. Uh, so now, uh, let's see, I'm losing, that was the lecture. I'm losing track of the question here, which was, uh, what was, oh, yes. Um, so so that, that question um, got right onto the, what's known as the Grossman Stiglitz puzzle which went like this, look, if markets are perfectly efficient and all prices are included, all the information in price is already included, then nobody can make any money reading the annual reports and trading on it, and then prices can't include the information. So there's a, there's a paradox there. Markets cannot be perfectly efficient, because if they were perfectly efficient, nobody would have any incentive at all to do any trading, and then markets wouldn't be efficient again. And so the, uh, the answer to that is, is, yeah, there has to be enough return to trading. Uh, let's just think economists. There's enough return to trading to, uh, that the people doing it can, on average, make enough money to justify their costs and keep them from going off and driving for Uber. Uh, so if, you know, that it, it's, it's just um, you, you have to make enough money. If, if traders start making less money than that, then they go off and drive for Uber. If the traders start making more money than that, more Uber drivers stop driving. And, and they go start trading stocks. You can tell from my funny story that uh, that seems to be an equilibrium where the, the actual the average person isn't uh, making a lot of money, which has been the the, uh, the notion that that markets are pretty darn efficient, at least with regard to information that isn't that hard to get. 
So did I answer the question there somewhere? Is it your guys' uh, job is to make sure that the rambling answers somehow talk about the question? Adam, what do you have to I say? Think, I think that's a that was a very good answer. Um, my take, whenever I I get a question like that, is often I'm I guess at family gatherings. I'm told, well, Adam, you can see this and this guy made a lot of money in in the market. Hence, the markets aren't efficient. Where to my answer will be, well, this just sort of proves that now the market moves a little bit back towards efficiency. So we don't. I I would object to your answer. Uh, One is, yeah, maybe that guy had a strategy and and, uh, uh, he had some price impact, which moved the market back towards efficiency. The other answer is, hello, survivor bias. so every, every day, you know, the bus comes back from Las Vegas, and the first lady out of the bus says, "Oh wow, I made a ton on the on the lot on the uh, on the slot machines in Las Vegas. Slot machines are inefficient," and everyone else kind of slinks off the bus, and you don't hear from them again. True. Yeah. Or Adam, go ahead. Adam's giving up. I. I, I <laughs> hey, Buncho, you're back. Do you have another question for us? Yes, sir. Uh, so when uh, you talked about the effic- when we talked about the efficient market hypothesis, so it re- uh, it says that uh, a stock price reflects uh, all the information, all the past information. So doesn't this mean that the uh, stock price or any asset price behaves like a time series? Um, yes. So a specific kind of time series. Uh, and so one. In other words, it's unpredictable. It, 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 the implication of a fi- let, let's go through the logic. Efficient markets is nothing more than the, than competition. Supply equals demand applied to stock markets. Um, and if if supply equals demand, it's hard to make money in the tomato market. Um, so, but but then what we do is what's 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 deep and interesting about this is that simple supply equals demand and competition has. Uh, unexpected predictions for how prices should behave. So if prices are, if markets are competitive, this is just basic supply demand, markets are competitive, uh, then what will happen is, is something should be unpredictable. And in the simplest form, the price changes should be unpredictable. Why? Because if you could tell the prices would go up tomorrow, everyone would try to buy today, and the prices would go up today. So that, that's, let's think about that logic. The logic is competition, uh, and, and free entry, everybody's able to buy, means that any information about value going up tomorrow will be reflected in the price today. That's kind of the big theory. And then the prediction is that prices will change randomly, uh, the sort of random walk hypothesis. The basic P equals E of MX is just the modern statement of that, exactly that idea. It's, it's not exactly prices that should be random, but uh, marginal utility discounted prices adjusted for dividends. Uh, but that's it. That's that is uh, that's what we're doing. So, but think about how deep that is. I mean, it took that took centuries. Um, you know, it, it, it was actually lots of academic papers to, to to figure that out. Basic competition, supply equals demand. Okay, duh. I know how tomato market works and supply equals demand. No, the su- basic competition, supply equals demand means that price changes are unpredictable. You won't. You cannot know whether prices go up and down tomorrow. Just as an example, in in the financial crisis. Every newspaper in the world said, oh, prices went down. Uh, all the lords of finance couldn't forecast it. That means you don't know what you're doing and markets are inefficient. Just think about how silly that is. Nobody could forecast where the, that the market would fall. Therefore, markets are inefficient. That's exactly the opposite, right? Markets are efficient means nobody can tell when markets are going to fall. And so the, the, the story just proves how... It's such simple logic, but it's not so obvious that you know every newspaper in the world can't get this one right. I've silenced you with my tirade. How are you doing? Dipanchu, you okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> Just uh, oh, one thing more. Uh, oh, when you talk about uh, that uh, pure competition supply demand procedures, so in the uh, days before the crisis, uh, in the boom years, we see that uh, uh, growing stock price attracts more buyers, which uh, gives on more uh, stock high prices. And there comes a stage when uh, there are no buyers. So that's a position where the efficient market hypothesis goes wrong. I mean, 
the competition because the supply is same limited yet the demand is increasing and the price still increases uh, well maybe uh, you know and so how short were you at the top of the boom well uh, i was a little kid so i was in very poor <laughs> Well, we'll see if it's so obvious to you in real time uh, next time around. Uh, you know, that's a story that's told, but there's something profoundly, you're attributing profoundly irrational behavior to people because you're saying uh, the people in the market don't understand that this is going on and that, that this thing could blow up at any moment uh, and therefore it, at some point it would be smart to be short. Um, the alternative view is that, look, it's boom economic times. And it's, if people aren't so much feeding, when you say people are feeding from past prices and buying, there's, you're, you're, you're attributing something fundamentally irrational to them or, or something perhaps super duper rational that they're inferring from a price increase somebody else has information that they don't have or something. You've got a fairly complicated model in mind there. The other view is, look, in economic good times, like 2006, like right now, uh, people are willing to hold assets despite pretty low expected returns. Because, uh, you know, what else are you going to do with your money? Then when an economic panic happens, people look at those same assets and say, well, boy, I can't bear to take risk right now. And so that's sort of the time-varying risk premium view. I'm, I'm not going to say we know which one it is, just that there's two different stories. And, and our job is to, you know, understand the theory behind them and see which one works. Okay. Uh, at, I think it was Adam's turn or Nina's turn. Whose turn was it? I, I can do this one. So okay. it's, it's a very brief question. It's from Deb from, in, uh, from India, uh, who works in a US-based uh, investment bank, a background as an engineer and mathematics. He asked sort of a, a logistical question about the, the course, the future of the course. Uh, will you also teach uh, derivative pricing models? For example, uh, the derivation of the Black-Scholes option pricing formula uh, and partial differential equations. He thinks that they would be really awesome uh, to, to, to look at these uh, products. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I think I've, uh, I was just doing the part two. I think we're going to do that in the second half of part two of the class. We'll do one week. You might be disappointed. Uh, we're going to derive the Black-Scholes formula. We're going to unite the Black-Scholes formula with price equals P equals E of MX kind of thinking. We may talk about what a partial differential equation is but we're not going to go into numerical techniques for solving partial differential equations. Nina. Yeah, I'm here. Good. And I can ask another short question. Good. Uh, what are, so the question is from Mar Mario Bravo, and um, he's uh, a new um, in this um, area, and he asks, what are your favorite sources of data? He was thinking about the dividend to price ratio and also about pharma fa factor model. Um, yeah? Okay. Um, Mario Bravo. Um, hi, Mario. Um, okay, so I, I have to not be too much of a salesman here. Of course, the Center for Research and Security Prices at the University of Chicago is the world's greatest source of data for finance. Well, well it is, actually. Uh, so CRSP, look up see CRISP data, available on uh, the WORDS uh, website, which is where most of us get it from. Uh, what's great about the CRISP data is it's very clean. Uh, and I have seen uh, quite, a, especially if you're researching strategies, I've seen quite often people research strategies using uh, inferior data sets and they get some great money-making idea. They go, oh, wow, let's go trade this. It turns out that their data set mistreated, say, delistings. So when a company goes bankrupt and leaves, how much money do you actually get? Well, if you, that isn't written correctly in the data set, it's very easy to get strategies that, uh, that, that, uh, that don't make money in, in the real world. Uh, a shorter version, the, the Pharma French stuff is available on Ken French's web page. So if you Google uh, Kenneth French, you'll find his web page, and he's made available all sorts of uh, free, interesting data. And that's where most of the stuff, all of the stuff that we're using in this class comes either from Chris or from Ken French. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, that's a big topic. Uh, uh, there's lots of uh, macro data. I, I, I like the uh, FRED database from the St. Louis Fed. Uh, makes stuff very easy to get at. Um, the world, though, is going to lots of uh, 
bigger high frequency data sources and, and um, each one is kind of individual. A good way to, that I do things is I read papers by people. If I'm interested in say foreign exchange, I read the latest foreign exchange papers, I make note of where the authors say they got their data, I email them and say, hey, where'd you get the data? Uh, and that's my uh, effort to get data. Uh, so I, we have some graduate students here who might be better at the data advice. Nina, uh, Adam, what do you, what's your advice on this? Um, I use uh, the data from Data Stream and Bloomberg for, for my research for the currencies. Um, and it looks oh, like... Let me interrupt you. This is, a, this is a very good advice. If you can get a Bloomberg terminal and you can learn how to use it, which is a real pain in the butt, Nina, I'm very impressed that you know how to use it. Uh, that's a great source of, of lots of data. They're not very clean. There's a, there's a trade-off between high frequency, lots of it, availability, and clean. I think it helps to understand the market here. Uh, people who are selling data are not selling to academics. They are selling to traders. And the traders want up to the minute, they don't want long historical clean data. So we're kind of, we're kind of like scurrying around uh, and, and trying to pick up crumbs from <laughs> data that's made for some other uh, point. Sorry, go ahead, Nina. Um, yeah, and uh, with Bloomberg, you also should be careful with the data fields. Like, uh, during the last two weeks, we tried to understand whether the last price means the indicative price or trading price. And we were asking Bloomberg at our institute and also from Deutsche Bank and from Swiss National Bank. They all attacked Bloomberg asking those the same question, what, what kind of data is that? And, we got mixed answers and we spent one week before figuring out what is that. So maybe with Bloomberg it's also difficult with, to work with help desk, but that's, that's how it is. No, no, that's a very good story to pass on to people doing data. So you'll often see a price and it says price. Is that the bid? Is that the ask? Is that the midpoint? Is that the last transaction? Is that uh, three days ago's price because that's the last time anybody ever bought anything? Um, you know, misusing uh, data like this is, is a a tried and true way of finding things that aren't aren't, aren't there, uh, and it, it takes a lot of work to clean it up. Adam, you got some data advice? Sure. I think there are, there's a difference between seeking out data as a trader or as a, as a researcher, but I guess it all comes down to you want to generate a, a comparative advantage. So one of the things that I've been looking at recently, and it goes back to our discussion of qualitative versus quantitative uh, data, is I've done uh, some what's called web scraping, where you write a little computer program, and the computer program goes online and reads websites and then downloads the text. And then I'm trying to look at whether I can analyze sort of the, the, the articles online and, and quantify that. And that hopefully, that will be one way to, to generate new data sets that aren't already uh, out there. Because my, I find that most of the data sets that are readily and easily available have already been exploited. So if you want to do something new, you might as well try to create your own data set. So Adam, this is a wonderful thing that you're bringing up. And I, I want to echo this advice to everybody, to all our, our dozens and dozens of viewers. Um, <laughs> this, is the, this is a very uh, exciting moment in economics research and finance research. And lots of people are doing uh, what, what Adam just mentioned. Uh, scraping the web, finding new data sets. Um, it's certainly true that more regressions have been run on CRISP data than there are data points in the CRISP data set. Uh, so you have to be really, really smart to think of a regression that nobody has ever run. In that <laughs> Whereas finding new data, it's kind of, you, the excitement of the new data means you don't have to be anywhere near so clever about, about using it and figuring things out. Um, recently, uh, Matt Jenska, who's at the University of Chicago, just got the Bates Clark Award for the best economist under 40. And and he, he what did he do? Like, like generations before him, he had a comparative advantage. He knew how to scrape data off the web, in the same way that you know uh, um, uh, Gerard de Brew got the Nobel Prize, and and I took his class, and he said, look, I, I wasn't particularly smart. I just happened to know functional analysis, and nobody else knew that, so I saw a way to apply it. So so arbit New, bringing new technology into economics is, is a great way to do research. And we are at the moment that, that this guy uh, using the web to get information is the technological revolution of the moment. So when people ask me advice, what, what should I learn before I go to graduate school? Should I learn measure theory or functional analysis? I say no. Learn how to program a computer. Now while we're at it though, uh, 
do follow, do read and follow your university's IT practices. Uh, if you start scraping the web and downloading hundreds of thousands of websites, you will very quickly be shut down. Uh, so do this right. Adam, do you have you know, two words of how to not get in trouble if you're scraping the web? Read the rules. And abide by the rules and, and don't do it excessively. So one thing that you can add to your code is, is a small uh, waiter or a, a small element that pauses your, your code every time it hits a new website. That so are you using it. Python to do this? Excuse me? Are you using Python to do this? How, what's your technology for web scraping? I've, I use primarily Python and R. And, and I like them because they're sort of readily free available, and there's a, a massive community out there on the internet that provides help. Yeah, uh, there's, also, there's another University of Chicago graduate student, uh, CK, who's doing uh, work uh, with Twitter feeds, and he, he got he's able to get uh, you know gazillions of Twitter feeds, and is using that to to link, you know link text data to asset prices. This is all very exciting new stuff, uh, um, and, and you can also web scrape to um, so finding company financial reports and stuff like that, uh, people have, have scraped web to find all, all sorts of inter interesting information like that. Okay, that was a great question. Um, uh, let's see, who's, who's next here? I have a question from uh, Kim Jensen, who's based in London. He has an academic background in economics and a professional background in investments. He, uh, he says he particularly liked the format of the course where we gain insights through the exercises and quizzes rather than simply being instructed. But his question is about the stochastic discount factor and, and, then, and it solves the utility maximization problem. So this is in the, in the very introduction to your book, John, on, on page five. We define consumption today as um, E, the endowment, minus P times Xi, so C, C of T, is equal to E minus P times Xi, and consumption tomorrow, C of T plus one, is E plus X times Xi. Then he asks, sort of the, the marginal condition we solve for P is equal to E M M X is, has CT and CT plus one inside the utility function? And then he asks, do we still use, do we still either use the above definition of consumption um, or do we now use that consumption today is equal to E today and consumption tomorrow is equal to E tomorrow? So, so either use the, the, the equations that I read out before or use B, C, T is equal to E, T and C, T plus 1 is equal to E, T plus 1. Yeah, oh boy, I, so I don't have the equations uh, in front of me. Um, and let me try to give a conceptual answer. The final, uh, the equation we end up with, our, our uh, this, uh, sorry, I gotta find out. We're kind of low technology here on the equations. Uh, P, run an equation. Did I write it correctly? Yes. Uh, so, the equation, price times marginal utility of consumption today was expected, beta, marginal utility of consumption tomorrow, xt plus one. Did I get this right, guys? I hope so. It's really embarrassing if not. Okay, so uh, I think the question is down to the, the object, the ct and ct plus one in that equation. That refers to the consumption after you've bought all you want. So, um, in, in this hypothesis, suppose you get an endowment and then you buy things, then yes, you might buy uh, you might buy a thousand dollars of the stock, and so the the C that ends up in in this equation, that's after you've bought all you want. You think about on the margin maybe buying a little more, and you decide, nah, it's not worth it. So that is the post trade uh, consumption. Maybe maybe a graph will help here. Um, sort of. In sort of standard uh, supply and demand economics, we start with an endowment, and then uh, we, we trade at some price and end up 
where the margin, the ratio of margin utilities, that, that consumption there is that consumption there. It's the post-trade after you've bought everything you want consumption. You think about making marginal changes and, and you decide not to. Does that sound to you guys like I answered the question? Yes, I think so. I... Now, okay. what... Sorry, what... One takeaway from, from this equation that, that I find very in, intuitive is if we, if we compare two different individuals, for example, um, and, and, and I have a different preference for smoothing my consumption over time. Maybe I, I really like to smooth over time. I, I want to eat the same amount every day, whereas John, you... Uh, you are more sort of uh, rational. You know that, that if you save today, you will have more tomorrow. Um, we will, we will still both of us observe the same price. We we both see the same price in in the market, but we might end up making different choices. And just by so the one simple assumption that that I value more smooth consumption than, than you do, we can then infer which choices uh, we will make about consumption between today and tomorrow. So let, let me, uh, Adam just said, I'm going to put up the same graph again because it's such an important uh, question. But we've got to come up with a quiz on this. Oh, and I, I meant to thank the previous questioner on, on the quizzes. These quizzes are really hard. So this is the first time anybody said, I like the quizzes, and, and you just made my day. I spent the whole day yesterday on two questions of a GMM quiz for, for week seven. And so uh, to have somebody say they like it is great. Okay, back to the topic. Here is uh, the, uh, the graph, the indifference curve graph. And uh, the solid line is Adam. And the slightly dashed line on the side is John. And Adam said John prefers consumption tomorrow, whereas Adam likes consumption smooth, the same amount of consumption in both days. So should I? Yeah. This, the x-axis is consumption today, and the y-axis is consumption tomorrow. So Adam's story was that Adam wanted to sm consume smoothly, the same amount today and tomorrow, whereas John wanted to consume more tomorrow and, and less today. Uh, Adam said something about rational, which I, I, I need to go slap you for. Come on, Adam, we're both being rational here. It's about different preferences. But I'm more, this is, I'm more patient than Adam. Now, if you do this in words, you get all confused. You say, oh, well, the more patient person is willing to pay a higher interest rate and the less patient person wants a lower interest rate and how do we have asset prices that are same when some people are more patient than other people maybe that's an arbitrage opportunity you know and three beers later you still haven't figured it out but um, that's the point of marginal economics uh, what happens is facing the same price we trade to a point where Adam is eating the same amount both days I am at a point where I'm eating more tomorrow and less today but on the margin, we're both agreeing on the margin. Our, our, the ratio of marginal utilities is equal. The ratio of margin utilities is the price ratio. Is the uh, this is the R is the R is the rate of return, right? So we are agreeing on at the margin, the post trade, after we've cons after we've made all our plans, we agree on the margin about relative values of today till tomorrow. Even though I'm more patient than you are. So I'm more patient, I have fundamentally different preferences, but somehow we've agreed on the margin about what the trade-off of today versus tomorrow should be. I'm, I'm repeating myself over and over again, but this is like such a common fallacy. Once you see this, you go ding, and all of a sudden you've become an economist. Okay, how did I do there? Well, maybe, Very good. Maybe we beat it to death, but it's such a common, and we've, we're actually, we're getting all these questions about what about different preferences. This was, I forgot, was it Bruno or somebody asked a question about old people versus young people. And, and uh, should we have different preferences for old versus young? Well, different preferences mean we end up in different places, but our marginal utility ratios are always equal to price ratios. So at least in the partial equilibrium, different preferences aren't that big. In the general equilibrium, if there's lots more people of one kind and lots more, then, you know, then prices will be affected. But to, to the first order, different preferences are not that big a deal. Okay, I'm just getting going here. Nina. Yep. The next question is from Tom. He's a management consultant from San Francisco. Uh, he finds 
convincing the evidence that returns are predictable. Is there a significant controversy on this issue among academic financial economists? Since uh, you titled a paper, The Dog That Did Not Bark, A Defense of Return Predictability, there must be some doubters. Is the controversy about whether expected returns vary versus expected returns are constant? Or is it the controversy about whether variation in expected returns can be tracked using simple financial ratios like dividend to price ratio? Are there still economies that model expected returns as constant? Uh, yes. Um, so you, the nature of academia is that there's controversy over everything. If, if you start, if you stood up at a conference and said the moon is made of green cheese, we, we would spend an hour debating that question. Uh, now, the the nature of return predictability is such that it's uh, it, it's uh, um, if return predictability were were simple, were um, you know on uh, yeah, on on foggy days in San Francisco stocks go up, on sunny days stocks go down. Uh, and the R squared were 80%, this would be easy, and it would be a clear violation of, of efficient markets. The nature of return predictability seems to be that it's very low, slow moving, uh, low, uh, long horizon, uh, just where it's kind of hard to see statistically. So there is plenty. I wrote that paper, The Dog That Didn't Bark, in response to academic papers that said, look, the predictability, the evidence really isn't there. And uh, that you know the t statistics are two and a half, but it's easy to get two and a half t statistics, and things don't work out a sample. Uh, this was a, a paper by Goyle and Welch. It was an excellent paper showing that many predictors didn't work in real time. Now, of course, our, our point was, of course, they don't work in in, in real time, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not there, um, uh, or, or that agents don't know about them. Uh, so it is still uh, controversial. Um, the point of that paper was it's hard to our, our best guess about the world is so convincingly in the in the range of return predictability that seems the, the place to go. But it, it, one can argue about any kind of evidence. Now, are there people who still really think whose, whose worldview is that expected return should be constant? Um, uh, I'd say yes. Um, now it depends by which expectations. If I'm, so to try to. I'm going to try to put words to Bob Schiller's worldview. Um, uh, Bob Schiller just got the Nobel Prize and has been a, a big, uh, uh, you know, one of the people working in this area. Perhaps his view is that expect the returns vary over time, but they shouldn't, because he writes down a present value model with constant expected returns and then says prices are too volatile. That's a, in a sense the same thing as expected returns vary over time. Um, but uh, um, but there's a worldview that that in fact it's it's constant expected returns and, and bubbly behavior and prices. What am I doing? Um, Adam got a uh, a response that I didn't do a great job on that question. I should have. That was good. Yeah. Uh, so how can we summarize? Uh, yes, controversy. Um, 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 most the the bulk of the evidence. Well, I guess I should make the hundred zero point that the the evidence the, the worldview is it is is so uh, you you have to sort of argue you can argue the t statistics two and a half, but you're arguing about whether um, uh, you, uh, you're arguing about such enormously different things that the two and a half t statistics that. Uh, you're having to argue that the world is the moon really is made of green cheese, but the t statistic is only two and a half, uh, and so we're 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 mistakenly thinking that it's made of rocks. Well, the difference in green cheese and rocks is so enormous. I'd rather go with the point estimate of of rocks and and think about it. Yeah, I didn't do a great job, but you know, trying to do it a third time isn't going to help either. <laughs> Coming and going. Uh, uh, next time he shows up, we should get him to ask a question. Uh, so, uh, but in the meantime, I guess uh, whose turn? Uh, Nina's turn. I I can do the next oh, one. I think. I think I Hi, Dipacho. Can I ask a question? Dipacho. Very back and frozen. Dipacho, can you hear us? 
No, it looks like no. Okay, well, uh, whichever of Adam or Nina's turn is next. All right. I've, I've got a question here. It's from Moreno. Moreno is based in Milan in Italy, uh, a background in economics, and works in bond portfolio management. He has a question about the cross-section of stock returns. Says, uh, in, in the first part of the lecture, you show that the superior performance of small versus big stocks can be accounted for in the context of the traditional capital model with the market factor. In other words, small stocks offer higher returns simply because they have higher beta. But then how come Pharma and French introduce in their model a third factor besides the market factor in HML, namely the, the SMB? If we can explain the performance of small versus big stocks simply by uh, the market factor alone, isn't SM, the SMB factor uh, somewhat redundant? He asks. Moreno, that is a fantastic question. Uh, so uh, there's, there's three levels of answer. So yes, um, small stocks seem to be, uh, it, when all is said and done, the data's been cleaned, uh, it seems that small stocks are very, very well explained by their betas, uh, which says we don't really need another factor. In another, uh, we don't need the SML uh, factor in order to generate their prices. But something very interesting happens. The small stocks all do tend to move together. So if we think about, I'm going to write a regression. Sorry, it's going to take me a moment. Uh, REI equals uh, alpha I plus uh, beta I times RMRF T uh, plus uh, SI SM uh, B T plus epsilon I T. So here is, I'm thinking of a Fama French regret times, a Fama French time series regression. I left the HML out here because it's not really important. So we're thinking about, we're running a regression of the uh, stock returns, uh, size portfolio stock returns on the market and the SMB factor. And so Moreno's question is really, what happens if we include or don't include that small factor? So I'll tell you what happens. Uh, if you just have the market factor, market betas, it turns out that the market betas are high where the expected returns are high, and so the alphas end up being just about zero. That's what we discovered. Now, uh, in that regression, the typical uh, R squared is gonna be about 0.6. Uh, I'm guessing, but it's going to be a number like 0.6. So now what happens if we, and the betas vary, uh, the, the small stocks, the small portfolios have high beta and the big stock portfolios have low betas. What happens now if we, uh, if we put back in the SMB factor? What happens is that the betas all become one, <laughs> the loadings on the SMB factor go up and down a lot, the alpha remains zero and the R squared goes up to about uh, 95%. I'm making up numbers, but it's about right. So adding the SMB factor doesn't make any difference on the alphas. We price things about as well. It shifts the uh, explanatory part from the market to the SMB factor. So the S's vary rather than the betas vary. And it raises the R squared from 60% to 95%. So this is an example, the SMB factor is, uh, is an example of a factor that explains lots of variance, right? The, the fact that the R squared is going up, the fact that the T statistics are big on the S's, that means that the SMB factor is explaining lots of the variance of returns. Boy, my, my writing is getting to be, I need my blackboard back. The SMB factor is explaining lots of the variance of returns, but it's not doing a lot to explain the mean returns. So SMB is an important, in the, in the tradition of factor analysis, SMB is an important factor. It captures, there is a fact that there are times when all the small firms go up or down together. It turns out that that co-movement isn't really important for explaining expected returns. There's common movement that whose, whose risk price happens to be about zero, but it's important common movement. So what do we use models for? Well, we're, we often use models um, for explaining variances. If you want to hedge a portfolio, you can hedge a portfolio with 95% accuracy by matching it to an SMB factor and only 60% accuracy. So hedging is something where you want to minimize variance. There you want a factor 
that helps to explain variance, even if that factor isn't doing much to explain mean. Even if you want to explain mean, now the fact that the R squared goes up so much, that means the standard errors of the betas are going to be much smaller in the two-factor model, so you'll measure things better. So they included SMB, I think, uh, because it helps to explain variance. It's an important factor for factor analysis. It's important for performance attribution. Uh, and it helps to clean up standard errors, not because it's absolutely necessary to achieve low alphas. And, and I, think, I think this is, boy, i got to write some quiz questions on this. This is a, a, we should come back to this and discuss this in more t detail. It's a great example of how we use models for different things. We're not just here to have the minimal model for small alphas. In many practical applications, we want factors that, that help to explain variance but, but aren't necessary really to get low alphas in a deep rationality sense. Uh, another classic example of this is industry portfolios. So I'm sure there's a quiz question in there somewhere that says, we got the CAPM is true and an industry, should we add an industry portfolio? And, and you're asked to puzzle about that. So I'll give away the answer, because the answer is the same one as here. Well, if you're thinking about Apple stock, an industry portfolio is going to help explain its variance a lot. If the CAPM is true, that's not going to do much for your alphas, but it's going to explain a lot of the variance. And so for purposes where you want to explain variance for, for performance attribution, for hedging, go ahead and put it in anyway, even though it's not really uh, important for pricing. I think it was a very clear answer. Thank you, Nina. Even though slightly too long. Okay, I think that's about it for, for this week, unless there's anything else uh, pressing. Nothing extremely pressing. There I'm are sorry. tons of questions, so why don't we, next week we can try to be even faster. Okay, we'll be even faster, and uh, if you guys see the questions that are important, uh, send them on to me, and I'll, I'll try to give some brief answers by email on a forum or something of the sort. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you. Nice Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.